Hey guys, this is your friend Iggy back again. So a few days ago, The Verge put out a video on how to build a PC. The problem is this video has so many issues that you can actually mess up your PC and they don't go over a lot of details. Just kind of here's how you do it and whatever. So The Verge comes out with some good content. I'm not going to put that past them. They do put out good content. Unfortunately, this probably should have been checked before they actually clicked publish. But anyway, uh, we're going to go through it here and I'm going to pause in between just to talk through some of the pieces. So let's go through it now real quick. So a few years ago, TC or managing editor built a gaming desktop, but it's kind of out of date and it's definitely not going to hold up for Battlefield 5. So let's build a new one. All right. You can build a gaming desktop for around $1,000, but I want to go all out, so I spent around $2,000. PC okay. like this is going to be able to play most games at ultra settings. So, what do you need to build a desktop? Well, of course, first you need a table. Preferably not metal. If it's going to be metal, have an anti-static working surface layered on top of it, a thermal paste applicator, an Allen wrench, some tweezers to tighten up the wires, So, look at those tweezers. Tweezers are meant to pull little tiny things out, like maybe pull out an, uh, an, a hair, or you know, maybe maybe the reason he wanted a, a a tweezer was maybe a screw fell, and he wants to pull it out. Those are zip ties. They're meant to bundle up cables to make them look nice. So let's keep going. A Swiss Army knife, which hopefully has a Phillips head screwdriver in it. So, instead of using a Swiss Army knife, how about use a screwdriver, a Phillips head screwdriver. It's a lot better and you don't have to like cram your hand and don't use a Swiss Army knife. It'll work, but it'll be a lot more difficult. And last but not least, an anti-static bracelet, which is to protect you and the parts. These are the... So yeah, you can use an anti-static band if you have it connected to ground you need somewhere to get rid of that esd it's not just gonna it's not wi-fi it's not gonna magically disappear into thin air that's not the way it works that rubber band needs to be grounded somewhere in order to discharge but if you are going to use that make sure it's attached to a ground somewhere parts you're going to need. But more importantly, before we get there, we need to understand what these parts are doing and how they interact with one another. To better understand the parts that make up a desktop, let's try to understand them individually. The processor is like the computer's brain, a base of calculations that control everything the computer does. The motherboard is like the foundation, serving as a main structure for all other parts to be added to. It also allows the other parts to communicate with one another, which also makes it kind of like a nervous system. Graphics cards are responsible for rendering and processing visuals into what you see on screen. Our PC's power supply is of course channeling electricity, in that it adjusts and provides the right amount of energy to keep it running. Last but not least, RAM, or random access memory, and your hard drive are good examples of short-term and long-term memory, respectively. If you want to better understand what kind of computer to build, then first figure out what you want to use it for. A gamer might care more about a graphics card than, say, a video editor who might want extra RAM to assist with editing large files. If you're building a budget build for video streaming, say, under $1,000, you want to focus on parts, like a Core i5 or Core i3 processor, that require less energy. They'll be less powerful, but then you'll be able to scale back the cost of several other parts. And if you need help choosing the right parts for your build, there are sites like PCPartPicker.com that help show presets for which parts fit together, which sort of part conflicts you might have, and where to find deals on new parts. We have a lot of boxes and a lot of PC parts, so it's best if you unbox them, isolate the parts that you really need, place items into the case, and make sure that they all fit, and then start working. And now we're really gonna start building by adding the motherboard in. Some notes about installing motherboards, they're really delicate, you should be really careful with them, and screw in with confidence, but also don't screw in too hard, otherwise you could cr I would screw with confidence. <laughs> crack the board. I chose- Also, if you're screwing in a screw so hard that you're cracking the board you should not be building computers be gentle don't snap a motherboard 
Windows Asus Z370 motherboard for two main reasons. One, it has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and also it has support for NVMe SSDs, meaning you can get really fast SSDs that are really easy to install. Pay close attention to the brace that goes at the back of the computer. You always have to make sure. <laughs> it's the brace that goes in the back. Also known to most people as the IO shield. <sighs> I mean, it's just one after the other. That you really hammer it in because there's no screw. It really just has to go outside of the case and clasp onto the frame. And this is very important because otherwise you can't align the motherboard correctly with the holes. Yeah, not that you can actually look at the standoffs and screw it in. But I mean, the IO shield is good to have. Not 100% needed, but it's good to have. Very good to have. But yeah. We're just going to start installing all eight screws. Again, it's best to use one of these guys. Not that. It'll that'll work, but So next we're going to install the RAM on the motherboard. I chose Corsair's 16 GB Vengeance LED RAM for two main reasons. One, it has LEDs and we do like lights in our gaming desktops. Secondly, uh, it's pretty fast RAM. It's 2,666 megahertz, I believe. So it's pretty fast, and this motherboard supports that speed, which is most important. So it, the motherboard supports the speed, but he didn't go over the fact if the motherboard supported the RAM. For that, you check the motherboard's QVL or the qualified vendor list. That's going to tell you if that RAM is compatible. Now, chances are the RAM is compatible, but there are times where it's not. That's where the QVL comes in handy. The speed is great. The lights, the RGB lights, they're cool and everything. Pin number one should be the QVL, or at least knowing that it's compatible. But anyway. Open the slots first, and just aligning the stick with the middle of the strip, not with the end, and just lining that up with the logo. So once you hear that solid clasp and you don't see the gold connectors on the side anymore, that's when you know the RAM is in. Step three, we're going to install the hard drive, or in this case, the NVMe SSD. I chose this format of solid state drive so that I could input it into the motherboard without having to worry about extra wires or putting it in a separate part of the case and just getting really messy. I'm sure he's going to have a very clean looking PC. <laughs> This is from Kingston, and it's 480 gigabytes, so it's not a lot, but you can always upgrade this and swap it out, and it's only held down by one screw and the latch, so it's really simple and really straightforward. Speed for gaming is important when it comes to a hard drive. You want files to write quickly, and you want games to load quickly, so that's why it's best if you use an SSD. Okay, so step four, we're going to install the graphics card. I chose PNY's GTX 1080, which is overclocked. And so it's a pretty easy installation. You're just gonna find the gold connectors and you're gonna line this bracket with the back end bracket of your PC case. Now, which lane you choose depends entirely on what other parts you're gonna put in the system. Uh now, nine times out of 10, you wanna put the video card at the very top. That is the by 16 lane. If you put it maybe on slot two, chances are that's not a by 16. Well, it is physically a by 16, Electrically, it's a by eight. On some higher end motherboards, it's also by 16, but then you have to mess a lot around a lot with the bias to get that to work. So keep it at the very top. Again, there are instances, but it's best at the top. I'm just gonna pick the top one because the SSD is at the bottom and I don't wanna cover it. I just think it looks nice. So not covering it is a good idea because it looks nice. Uh, so. You don't want to cover it because they do get hot. There are no moving parts, but they get hot. So you want, you know, some good airflow over it, or at least some airflow over it to keep it cool. But anyway. Click down. Take your remaining brackets and just put them in the spots that you haven't used. You don't have to screw these in. They get bolted down by the back end bracket. So on that particular case, they might, but not all cases are like that. Some you have to screw in. And your GPU is installed. Power supply time. I chose Corsair's 850 watt power supply because I need enough headroom for ray tracing GPUs when they come out and I don't want to have to upgrade it again. I agree with that. I always err on the side of caution. I get a higher end power supply 
that is not only going to power my system today, that a lot of people might say, oh my God, you don't need that much, but I don't care what they say unless they're buying it for me. I want one that's going to work for today and that's going to work tomorrow as well with the bigger and better hardware as it comes out. And then mind you, as bigger and better comes out, they require less power, but then you add more stuff that might require more power. So keep yourself covered. So all you have to do is take the brick and make sure that the brick that you align it with these little insulating pads so that the power supply doesn't short circuit and come into contact with the rest of the system. So that's actually meant more for noise dampening rather than the power supply shorting out. But So just take it in, slide it in nice and easy until you have a snug fit, and then shift it to the back and make sure it's right up against the frame. Now so nine times out of ten, when you're installing a power supply that is fully modular like that one is, you're going to be in a very tight space that so you got to put it like this and then get a mirror and do so many things to get those cables in. When you could just put it in, plop, 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 connect them all outside of the case and then slide the cables through to put the power supply in. Now you just take the required screws and you tighten and screw in. So next step, we're going to install the CPU core. In this case, it's going to go on the top end of the case, and we're just going to have the hose hang out for a little while until we install the processor, which is going to come a little later. Always be sure to try to place it in the system first before you install it, because you can see it takes up a lot of space. But in this case, no pun intended, it fits in perfectly and we're gonna start screwing it in. And so there's nothing special about this screwing in process. No, 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 there, there, there is. Okay, this particular liquid cooling unit, you might be able to do that. You, you probably can't, but you might be able to do that. But typically they're put that way so that you can have fans over that in between the top of the case. And the screw is so long because it goes through the fan into the little hole, the screw hole on the radiator unless you're going to pop a hole through it. They're just really long screws because they go through the entire frame of the cooler. Because you're screwing through metal. And they take forever. Yeah. So next up, cables. Every power supply is going to come with a big bag of Velcro cables. It's kind of... Velcro cables. I've never seen that before. That's kind of cool though. Kind of daunting at first, so you always have to find the ones that are going to fit. In this case, you need to match those cables with the correct descriptions on the power supply. Next step is we're connecting the power supply to the motherboard with the 24 pin cable. We're just matching that cable from the motherboard. The ATX cable. Threading it through the back and attaching the 24 pin header to the power supply so that we can have one of the connections complete. The next few additions will be for the GPU, for any specific ports that the case has, for any lighting that the case has, the CPU cooler, the anything else really. We're installing the CPU, the heart of the computer or the brain, depending on how you look at it. So to do this, we're just gonna remove the plastic covering that they put on the motherboard. We're just gonna take this little plastic part out. We'll just toss that out of here. So you could do that, or you could store it in a drawer in case you wanna take that motherboard out, you wanna upgrade your motherboard, upgrade your CPU and maybe give that motherboard to a friend or sell it or whatever, but you still wanna use that CPU on your own build because if not, you could potentially bend those pins and then you lose the warranty on your board because nobody's gonna cover that. And sometimes you can actually bend them back, but not always. So keep that, put that away. You might need it. And now we have an exposed CPU holder, or rather slot. Holder or slot. Not a socket. Holder or slot. On the motherboard. And we're going to use the CPU applicator. This is a special... I've never seen that before, a CPU applicator. That must be brand new. Um, I, I don't know that I would ever use that, but... Uh, I mean, literally you just... Match the two notches on the CPU and the socket, pop it in, close the cover, and you're done. But he needs a CPU applicator. <laughs> Part that not everyone may get, but this motherboard that we got from ASUS definitely does have. It's called a CPU installation tool. It makes it really useful if you want to install 
a Core i7 Hexacore CPU. Yeah, we've got one. How'd he get one? I, I, I don't know where those things come from. He must work for Intel. And it's an eighth generation chip and it's ready to go and it supports overclocking. So what having oh this God. little installer does for you is it's basically a brace that you can apply right to the CPU and light it up with the triangles that you'll see on the bottom left corners. And this will make it easier for us to apply it to the motherboard and then apply thermal paste and then apply a CPU cooler on top. And we're just gonna carefully lean it down into the system and make sure that everything lines up and we're gonna clasp down on it and we'll be good to go. So we're about to apply thermal paste to the CPU. Every CPU cooler actually comes with a bit of thermal paste already neatly applied in a circle around it, but it's usually not enough. It's good, essentially PC building practice to have a little bit extra. So I wanted you to hear him say that. It's essentially good PC practice to add more to it. No, if it has thermal paste, you either use it or wipe it off, wipe it off, clean it, Make sure there's a mirror shine on it, like, you know, maybe with isopropyl rubbing alcohol, whatever, clean and clear, and then you apply your own thermal paste. It's just a dab or there are different methods. And layer it on top of the CPU. That's not a method. He's drawing a stop sign on the CPU. Stop! Don't do it that way. Thermal paste mostly not all thermal paste but most thermal paste is conductive so when he puts that heat sink on it's going to come off the sides and then it's going to touch the motherboard it's going to touch a, an exposed trace and it's going to die the computer's going to burn don't do that put like a grain of rice amount in the middle or maybe I, that's the way i do it or some people put a line some people put an X or some people put on there and then, a, you know, slide it across with their credit card. So it's smooth. There are many different methods. Don't do that one though. The final portion is to add the CPU cooler to the top end of the processor. So you're going to see that there are four brackets look, look, or rather look, they're like screws in here. Look at that CPU. He spray painted on it. Like he just, he threw up on it and that's good with brackets and holders right here and they're going to keep the cooler raised off the processor but it's also going to be close enough to actually physically come in contact with it like basically keep it cool take thumb screws like this and just screw them on so now that our internals are done we're going to put all the panels back on which is the top glass side glass front glass and of course the back panel where all this fun stuff is happening so we fully built the piece so if you remember towards the beginning, he had tweezers, also known as zip ties. He didn't use them because I don't see anywhere there. And now at the beginning, I don't know if I commented, I, I, I meant to, but I didn't, I see the RAM it is. He has it in the first two slots. Typically they go in the second and the fourth slot for dual channel. Now, on some boards, you can put it on the first and the third slot and still get dual channel. Sometimes it won't even post that way. I'm surprised it posted that way. That board may allow you to do that, but make sure you read the manual so that not only A, will it post, but that B, so that you can have dual channel if your memory supports, if your memory runs in dual channel, because chances are that's running in single channel right now. But anyway see everything's put together and we got to the post screen so what's next surprised i'm sure it wasn't the very first boot though well you need a usb flash drive with your windows installation media on it and of course a license key so i plugged that up installed windows in a couple of minutes installed a bunch of drivers and now we have a fully functioning gaming pc ready to run fully run some games. Right now I've got Armor 3 running, running at maximum settings, native resolution, which is 1080p HD. So you have a 1080, GTX 1080, I think it was a TI, and you're running at 1080. Yeah, no, it's going to run good at 1080, come on. 
and it's running pretty smoothly. Like, um, I'm averaging 70 and 80 FPS, and this is normally like a very intensive game to run, and it's still doing a pretty good job. So right now I'm playing League of Legends. It's one of my favorite games. I'm actually playing against a bot, and I'm distracted, so I'm not actually doing so well. But um, otherwise, like, this is pretty much what you would see me do on a gaming computer. Test stuff out, and hopefully have really high frame rates like I am right now. I'm so he doesn't play games on a gaming computer. He clicks a lot. <laughs> Come on, dude. Averaging 120 FPS, and that's only because I've actually locked the game to that frame rate because I can get around 300 FPS playing League on maximum settings, which is a little bit absurd, and you don't really need that, so I locked it. Building a gaming desktop has been a great experience. I'm able to max out a lot of my favorite titles, and I'll be able to play a lot of upcoming titles like Battlefield 5 and Cyberpunk 2077 without worrying too much about the parts I have. When ray tracing GPUs come out, for example, I'll be able to upgrade without having to buy a completely new system. And if I have a problem down the line, I can always just swap out a part and have it serviced rather than losing my whole computer. And of course, now we also have a computer to test and benchmark games here at The Verge. Though I'm sure it's not gonna last very long, but anyway. All right, so, so many things wrong with this video. Uh, you know, I feel bad. I'm sh I know The Verge and this guy have all the best intentions. They really wanted to show you guys how to build a computer, but nowhere, or basically nowhere in this video, did they get granular with it. Get up close, show you how to match up the CPU notches and correctly install or insert the CPU, close the lid and lock it in place. They don't really show you how to install the RAM or how to install it. They just, they kind of briefly go over things. And then the, 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 the part that killed me was that thermal paste. What's, I mean, come on. There's not enough thermal paste. No, you, there's, there's more than enough there. And then when you put it on there, like you were just like kind of pouring water on there. Cause come on. So they had all the best intentions. The Verge puts out good stuff and every once in a while you put something bad out, but nobody looked at this video and said, whoa, there's a bunch of issues here. I think they just, you know, encoded it. This is gold, publish, come on. But anyway, I'm sure The Verge is gonna have a video maybe soon the correct way to build a PC. But in the meantime, I've linked up above a bunch of videos that I have that show you how to build a computer correctly. And mind you, I'm not God or a God or whatever. I make mistakes too. We all, every single one of us makes mistakes. But the video was riddled with mistakes, you know. But, so, but, you know, I'll help you how to build computers. And you know what? If you don't like me, that's fine. There are a bunch of other videos on how to build a PC. This one, that video should have been how not to build a PC. It should have been a satire. Hopefully, maybe they're going to say, yeah, it was a satire. and Nobody's going to believe that it was, but that was bad. Sorry, guys. The Verge, you guys come out with great stuff all the time. This was not an example of that, though. But anyway, this is Iggy out. See you guys.